Hi. Today we're going to pull all the strands that we've um, been looking at so far in this course together uh, in an example of behaviour at the neurobiological level. And we'll be looking at the uh, evolutionary aspects and the biological and the neurological aspects and also the um, environmental aspects. And the subject that we're looking at will be uh, the behavioral neurobiology of aggression. Uh, while aggression is not a very pleasant topic, it is one that it's one that's well researched and a lot of information is known about it. And also it's one that is very important to the human species at an individual uh, family, community, national and global level. And uh, it wouldn't do us any harm to know more about it. Um, so we'll, get, we'll launch into today's uh, topic and uh, see where we go from there. So the subsections in this topic are, uh, well, first we'll have a look at an overview of the behavior, uh, the neurobiological aspects of behavior. Um, we'll look at hormones and aggression. And we'll look at early experience, early life experience and aggression. And we'll look at uh, evolution, aggression, and cooperation. So firstly, the overview of the topic. And in this section, we'll be uh, examining why, why it is where we're looking at aggression, which you've already, already touched on. Uh, we'll be looking at primate aggression, remembering that uh, the human species evolved from primates, originally from great apes, then uh, in, in company with chimpanzees, down to about 3 billion years ago. And then we branched off from the chimpanzees and uh, became hominins. And then after that, we'll be looking at the limbic system and aggression and the amygdala and aggression, and finally the prefrontal cortex. So why examine aggression? Well, as we've already said, uh, there's a lot known about it and it's a very important topic for the human species right now in our evolution. And um, firstly, we'll look at the neuro, neurobiology of aggression. We'll look at then the influence of other factors, including hormones. And finally, we'll look at the evolution of aggression. And with primate aggression, um, all primates exhibit aggression. So there's no, apart from a, a form of chimpanzee called the bonobo, um, and they went in the opposite direction. They, they decided they'd make love, not war. Um, however, we cannot say that the human species in any, is in any way related, related to bonobos because bonobos branched off the chimpanzee tree where uh, after the human species branched off. So, so we, bonobos are not our evolutionary ancestors. They're a completely different um, branch of the chimpanzee tree. Um, so no, we can't claim that one. Um, so primates that, uh, or the rest of the primates who are all into aggression, um, were into killing other members of the same species. So they, they uh, I guess we would call that murder. So they weren't beyond committing murder. They committed inf infanticide. And that usually happened when a new alpha male um, took over the, uh, the clan and killed all the infants or the children of the or young, young, young children of the previous alpha male so that he could replace them with his own. And of course, that goes back to um, our DNA is imperative to uh, propel itself into the next generation. So, so the new alpha male's DNA uh, was very keen to get the alpha male to um, populate the, tribe, the clan or the tribe with uh, his DNA or their DNA, not the DNA of somebody else. Um, there was organized group violence. In other words, one clan attacking another clan. Um, and usually that was uh, over, over resources or access to females. Um, and uh, there was use of primitive weapons, not like uh, the hominin species have done, the Homo, Homo sapiens have done in the past 12,000 years, but uh, very primitive ones. Um, 
And since the advent of uh, or the invention of agriculture, humans have created uh, uh, an advanced technology of aggression um, to the point where we had to pull back because the weapons of aggression that we um, invented, the nuclear weapons, uh, would have meant the extinction of the human species. So rather than rather than go ahead with that one, we decided uh, we'd come far enough in, down the uh, weapon the technology treat, uh, path and uh, it was now time to take another look mind you since then aggression has still continued but has continued in a non-nuclear way and usually in smaller in smaller um, contexts not in a world war but in in regional conflicts um, and of course uh, as we saw in the second world war we were capable of, con of conducting warfare or aggression on a absolute global scale, which involved just about everybody, all human branches, or all the human uh, members of the human species on Earth. Um, okay, so now looking at the, the limbic system and aggression, and the limbic system consists of the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, um, and uh, many other parts, but they're the major parts. And they're all implicated in human aggression. And you'll get a, a nice uh, diagram of the limbic system, at least the, 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 the brain's part in the limbic system. And um, you can uh, follow that on the, on the chart. Now, the amygdala is highly implicated in human, uh, human aggression as well. Um, the mass murderer, Charles Whitman, who back in 1966, uh, took a sniper rifle into a into a tower, nice sniper rifle into a tower in Texas University, and and, and proceeded to um, uh, assassinate passersby. Um, they when they after he was executed, they found a tumor on his amygdala, so he was um, it was a malfunctioning amygdala that uh, contributed to his aggression. Maybe it well, probably wasn't the whole story but it certainly had a part in it. Now the inputs to the amygdala um, are the stress hormones, pain and sensory information. So those three things um, will get the amygdala activated. And the stress hormones are adrenaline, which is associated with fight or flight. The, nora, nor, the norepinephrine uh, for sensory focus, that's help us to hear and see better smell better, and cortisol, which enables us to perform feats of great strength um, and uh, fast movement. Then, of course, there's pain. If you're suffering pain, then that will activate the amygdala. And, of course, if you um, see a, a band of um, aggressors, uh, the enemy coming over the hill or people who are intent upon um, causing you harm, you see them coming towards you, then that sensory information alone will trigger the amygdala and you'll start um, going into the fight or flight response. Um, although they have recently added another one, which is the freeze response. So you've got the, the fight response, the, the flight response, and some people go into a freeze response. In other words, they do nothing. But it doesn't, doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, fight, flight, and freeze. Uh, as, as flight or flight does. Now, the outputs from the amygdala um, are activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And that's the, uh, that's the nervous system that gets us really hepped up and gets us uh, our heart pumping, our heart blood pressure elevated, our muscles um, pumped up with blood, ready to uh, either run or fight. Um, and then there's the excretion of stress hormones that activate other parts of the brain and motor function activation. So you'll get the, like, as I mentioned, the parts of the body that are involved in fight or flight will get um, highly activated. Now, the stimuli for aggression itself are usually fear, pain, stress, frustration. That's the, uh, the major four. So if someone is afraid, then they may become aggressive rather than do something else. Um, if someone is suffering pain, 
they may become aggressive and um, nurses in hospitals have discovered that sometimes when people are in pain, some of them um, cope differently from others and some become quite angry and aggressive. And the stress, if you're under stress, then I guess uh, your, your nerves get a bit frayed and you, some people are more inclined to uh, express their stress through aggression rather than through some other means. And then finally, frustration. In other words, if we have a, a want or a wish and we can't fulfill that want or wish, then some people, um, not all, but some people will resort to aggression in order to try and get their want or wish. Now, alcohol and aggression. Um, alcohol only causes aggression in, in individuals who are already predisposed towards aggression. So alcohol will not make a non-aggressive person aggressive. It'll only make an aggressive person aggressive. Now, testosterone and aggression, um, the uh, sort of the, the common wisdom, is street wisdom is that uh, the more testosterone a man has, the more aggressive he's going to become. In fact, that is not quite true. Uh, testosterone merely amplifies aggression in aggressive people. So if a man is not already predisposed towards aggression, his testosterone will not make him aggressive. However, if he is predisposed towards aggression, then his testosterone will amplify the, the um, aggression and make it bigger. And finally, the, the prefrontal cortex. Um, it's a part of the brain uh, where our consciousness is situated. In other words, that's where we make our decisions. That's where we do our rational thinking. And it's the part that struggles with cognitive, emotional and sensory information um, thrown up by the much larger non-conscious part of the brain. So the prefrontal cortex can only handle a small proportion of what's happening in the rest of the brain. And it's the, it's the, um, the parts of this, activa uh, this activity in the non-conscious brain that are most pressing that will actually find itself into the prefrontal cortex. Um, and whether or not we, we behave in a rational way or a purely emotional way is up to the individual. Some individuals are able to have greater control over their um, emotional impulses and some are. And of course, the, the prefrontal cortex is directly behind the, the, um, uh, the forehead, as we show a, a graphic of that on the, on the slides. Um, now, the prefrontal cortex is likened to a, a well-lighted stage, but a very small stage with a large number of actors waiting to, in the wings, trying to get on. So it's, uh, anything in there is, is well and truly in your consciousness, um, but it's only a small stage and there's a lot of uh, actors in our brain wanting to get onto that stage and, and strut their stuff, but only a small number can. So it's the ones that are most pressing, the ones that are most... Um, uh, we call it emotional at the time that will make it on. So our non-conscious mind is highly active, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. Even when we're sleeping, it's still active. Um, and it pushes the most emotionally pressing issue forward onto the stage, as I said, and rationality is not involved in the non-conscious mind. So the non-conscious mind is not rational. It's only the uh, prefrontal cortex part of it, the, the conscious part that's rational. And often um, uh, our rationality is used not so much to, to control our emotional impulses, it's more, like, more used to explain away our emotional impulses after they've had their way. So after we have an emotional outburst, our rational mind will then find, it will, it will invent a story or a narrative um, to make us feel good about what we just did. And that, that's the, probably the major role of the rational mind for human beings. It's more like a public relations firm that has been employed by um, our personality. And it, its job is to make us come out smelling sweet no matter what we do. And there is an evolutionary reason for that because uh, when we lived in small clans in evolutionary times, um, and uh, if we're ever expelled from the clan for bad behavior, then we're as good as dead because the clan down the road saw us as being uh, non-human and we saw them as being non-human. So it was a them and us situation. 
So if you got expelled from your clan, then you wouldn't last long but, uh, on your own out there in the forest. Not to mention all, all the, um, the wild beasts that uh, wanted to have you for lunch. Um, so the here, technically the prefrontal cortex is the area that deals with the regulation of emotions, provided that the individual concerned has developed that skill and ability. It's not something that comes naturally. Um, a human being has to learn how to um, regulate their own emotions. In the 1840s, a guy called Phineas Gage, a railway worker in the US of A, was um, working on a railway line and uh, drilling a hole, or tamping some di uh, dynamite into a hole to blow up a rock um, to clear the path for the railway line. And while he was tamping the dynamite in with a long metal pole, or probably a, maybe a five foot, four foot, five foot long pole, um, tamping that into, pushing it into the, or hammering it into the ground, the explosive exploded and the pole went straight, straight through his frontal, his prefrontal cortex, came up, up through his, um, I guess, the uh, brow ridge and then out through the top of his head. And he wasn't killed. He lived for quite a while after that. However, it did change his um, personality. Um, the, um, before the accident, his personality was one of a, a very gentle man who um, was polite and kind. After the accident, he became a wild man. After he, not, not so much a, a beast, but more like um, he was aggressive. He was um, uh, very, very difficult to be with, very difficult to deal with. Um, however, they do say after a number of years, he did start to, re to regain his former, um, you know, uh, socially acceptable self. Um, but what this accident did, it alerted the medical profession to the fact that um, the personality is in the brain and any damage to the brain will affect the personality. And that became as, as um, uh, very, very big news at the time because they had all sorts of other ideas about personalities in the human mind. And now they, they saw that uh, a bit of damage to this uh, a bit of meat in our, in our head um, can cause a personality to change. So personality must be somehow contained inside our head rather than somewhere else. And in rapid eye movement sleep, um, the prefrontal cortex uh, ceases functioning. So we, we no longer have a, a, a um, what do you call it, emotional control. So in our sleep, often when we have dreams that are, are scary or wild or antisocial, whatever. Um, one of the reasons is that our prefrontal cortex is not on the job, it's asleep, but the rest of the brain is working away madly. And um, the current thinking on, on the purpose of dreams is that it's, it's the brain trying to um, make sense of the world and to clear up, um, sort of get clear the debris out of the, uh, out of the, um, the system, out of the memory system out of the rest of the systems in the brain. And it's like, it's like, it's like um, house cleaning. So dreams are like house cleaning, house cleaning for the brain. Um, and there was a time when uh, psychotherapists and others thought that um, the dream, dreams had amazing significance, um, but that was more a case of wishful thinking. So it's, it's a case that they take a dream and then they, they build a story around the dream um, rather than taking a story and having a dream around the story. So it's, um, uh, if you have a, a, a dream that, that seems terribly, terribly significant, then um, it's probably, it's probably, you know, it, it probably is significant in a sense that your non-conscious brain um, is dealing with this particular issue and is throwing up, it may like maybe some sort of semi-type solution to the problem. Um, or to something about the future that you think you might have to do. Um, but uh, it's more likely just that the brain is trying to, to sort of repair itself, as it were, to get ready for the next day's activity. That's the next day's conscious activity. Um, now, a hyperactive prefrontal cortex causes a person to be too inhibited. So if you've got a prefrontal cortex that, that's um, uh, you know, 
working too hard, then you can find that um, there's very little, very little emotional um, content will get through. And you can see that in some people, uh, I, mostly in males, I haven't seen it much in females, but in males you'd see it, that um, they have no awareness of their emotions at all. Uh, they do have emotions, but they have no idea what they are and what they mean. Um, in fact, they don't even feel them. They're, they're numb to their emotions. So their, their emotions are completely inhibited. Um, and often they're emotionally repressive towards others. In other words, they'll try to stop other people from um, having emotions or having emotional expression. Yeah. And the prefrontal cortex can sometimes malfunction. Um, so you can have a, a prefrontal cortex. If it malfunctions, a person can become a violent sociopath. In other words, there's no, there's no inhibition there at all um, other than the inhibition required for that sociopath to get their own way. Sometimes they may need to, to uh, disguise themselves as a um, lovely person, a very sociable person, a very agreeable person, um, until the time comes where, it check, where it's, they need to click, click the switch and then turn into the monster that they really are. Um, and this can be caused either by genetics or it can be caused by physical injury. So it's, it's a... Um, uh, the genetics, genetics is more in the nature, in the nature of a, um, uh, uh, not a malfunction, a mutation. Or in, the, in a mutation, it might be an inherited mutation or it might be a personal mutation. Now, development with age, in other words, um, what happens to children as they grow up? Uh, well, the... The prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until 25 years of age. Um, so children, adolescents and young, young adults have relatively little emotional regulation depending on their stage of development. And this is why car insurance is more expensive for people under 25 years of age. And as we've seen in previous topics, um, the people under 25 years of age, that their uh, neurons are not fully insulated. In other words, the, the wiring in their brain uh, can easily short circuit. And um, so you have two things happening without, without that, uh, that um, fully insulated brain. Signals travel slowly and you can get uh, emotional short circuits. In other words, one, one network interfering with another network and, and, and um, sort of um, you call it, uh, making rational decisions very difficult to do. And one of the things that um, I find a bit scary is that the, the digital world that we live in has largely been designed by under 25 year olds. Google certainly has been. Uh, Google had a deliberate policy of employing people under 25 who um, had never had a job other than being a student at university. So they came out straight out of university, straight into Google and started working on all these amazing software and, and hardware devices um, that now more or less uh, control our world. And uh, so the, 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 uh, the, the mental processes, the mental processes of the people behind all of this design is not fully developed. In other words, um, there's a lot of cleverness in there, but very little wisdom very little emotional input. In fact, uh, to me, it's more like a bunch of kids who um, are having a great time coming up with all these clever ideas and it's like playtime. Um, but they are incapable of thinking about what are the long-term consequences of what they're doing. And uh, we've yet to find out what the, long, the truly long-term consequences are of living in a digital age. I can, I can, I've got my own uh, thoughts on the matter but um, that's only speculation. It may not be what actually happens, um, but uh, it's going to take us further and further away from, from um, being human, I think, and more towards being uh, non-social. So our sociability or our, our social skills will decline and um, we'll find it very, very hard to get on with people in a face-to-face -face situation. Um, I've seen... I've seen uh, um, situations 
where a family sat down at a table in a restaurant and every member of the family had their phone out and was doing stuff on their own phone. I've even heard of situations where a young male and a young female you know, went out on their first date and they couldn't talk to each other face to face. So they texted each other across the table <laughs> from phone to phone. <laughs> so uh, that's what I think is going to happen. Although um, uh, I have a policy which says that whatever we can imagine isn't going to happen because nothing ever turns out the way you imagine. So, so if we're imagining it, then it's not going to happen because, um, like I said, there's a rule. Uh, whatever you imagine never happens or never, never, things never turn out the way you imagine. Okay. Um, now, other brain regions. Um, so the prefrontal cortex can inhibit the amygdala. So that's the amygdala, sort of the, the nerve center. Um, and the amygdala, amygdala tries to override the prefrontal cortex as attempts to, in, in a bit to inhibit aggression. So you've got the amygdala fighting the, uh, fighting the um, prefrontal cortex when it comes to aggression. The uh, neurotransmitter serotonin um, is also involved in it. It helps to regulate uh, mood and social behavior. And the neurotransmitter um, dopamine um, assists the prefrontal cortex in increasing the expectation of pleasure by doing the harder thing. In other words, it's like if, um, if we know if, if our prefrontal cortex is disciplined enough and trained enough for us to know that if we do this thing that we want to do, this aggressive thing, then um, we're not going to feel too good in the future. Whereas if we, we inhibit this behavior, then we'll feel a lot better. So that's like an expectation of pleasure in the future by doing the right thing. And um, my, my take on, on pleasure is that um, human, human beings need to have a future because they need to imagine having, um, you call it, um, they need to, need, to, need to imagine doing pleasurable things in the future. So the, the real pleasure comes when you imagine doing the pleasurable thing in the future. That's where the real pleasure is. When you get to the actual thing that you, 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 you're uh, imagining or the thing that you're desiring, it's not nearly as pleasurable in, in reality in terms of how much dopamine is excreted by the brain as, as the expectation of the pleasure. So it's really the expectation of the pleasure that keeps us going. And that's why um, elderly people who don't have much of a future or they don't have the resources to do a lot of pleasurable things, um, they're in big trouble because they cannot get the, the dopamine shot of expectation of pleasure in the future. Um, so that, that becomes a bit of a uh, depressant for the elderly. Um, and it's not, a, it's not an easy, easy problem to solve, um, but it, it can be ameliorated. In other words, we, we do have to make the, the best of a bad deal. Okay, now getting to, going to the fight or flight response. Now in combat, in like a in necessary combat, you might say in a just war, if you want to make it, make it politically correct. Um, a soldier who, who is faced with um, going, you know, immediately going into combat um, and risking his life um, uh, has a choice. He can either, he can either um, risk his life or he can uh, hide and hold and hide in it. Um, so they, a, a soldier is trained to do the harder thing and the harder thing is to stay and risk his life rather than try to save his life. So it's a bit like, it, it's an interference. They're trained to have a, um, uh, to cut across the fight or flight response. When all, all the evidence says flee, run, um, they're trained to stand their ground and not run. Um, and you can imagine that takes an awful amount of courage to do that. Okay, now, um, hormones and aggression. And in this subject, we're going to be looking at um, testosterone and the amygdala. We're going to look at environment and aggression, childhood exposure to aggression, female aggression, glu glucocorticoids and aggression, and an aggression hormone, is there an aggression hormone? Well, firstly, testosterone, as we've mentioned already, um, testosterone doesn't activate 
amygdala neurons. Um, however, it does make already excited neurons more excitable. So it's it's a it's it's not an activator; it's an enhancer. Um, and there's also evidence that increased levels of aggression can also produce increased levels of testosterone. So it's like a, a, a closed loop. One, one increases the other. And um, that's why in some, in some aggression situations, the aggression just gets right out of hand um, until, until uh, sort of the uh, one or other party is, is completely and utterly um, um, annihilated. Um, which is regrettable. However, that's the way our brains evolved. Um, remembering that, that in evolutionary times, there was the aggression of attacking the neighboring clan to steal what they've got. Um, but then the neighboring clan couldn't allow the, the aggressors to come and do what they wanted willy nilly. So they had to aggress back in order to fight them off to stop them from, from taking whatever they've got. And, um, and killing all the men and taking all the women and children. So they, uh, uh, aggression is a two-way thing. It can, it can be done in a uh, sort of an uh, unnecessary way and it can be done in a necessary way. Um, now the environment and aggression. Um, and a study was done of the murder rates in London, Toronto and Detroit. And they showed that the highest rates of aggression were in males 16 to 25 years of age. And the highest rates of murder occurred in the most economically depressed areas. And I don't think we get any prize for, for, for working that one out. I think it'd be uh, sort of self-evident. Um, and the introduction of death penalties for um, uh, murder, um, they, it did lower the rate of premeditated murders, but it doesn't lower the rate of um, murders caused by an aggressive outburst. So if aggression is activated and someone dies as a result of that, then there's no amount of fear of punishment uh, will have any effect at all. Um, but if someone is planning a murder, then it might be different. If they're doing it in sort of cold blood and they think when they're in the got time to think, well, okay, I want to do this thing. It's, it's what uh, I really need to do. However, if I do this thing, then I might come off the worst for it. So it's possible that they could change their mind. Not all, of course, but some. However, with aggression, it sort of, as we saw, aggression is like a closed loop. It just it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, childhood exposure to aggression. Um, some children uh, who are exposed to aggression and abuse in the home do become aggressive adults, but, uh, but most do not. In other words, it's not guaranteed that exposure to aggression as a child um, or the, to the witnessing aggression will turn that child into an aggressive person. Um, and watching aggression on television only influences children who are already prone to aggression. In other words, children who are not already prone to aggression don't seem to be um, you call it influenced by watching aggression on television. Um, children who grow up in cultures where violence is allowed tend to be more aggressive as adults, which I mean, that, that's sort of no prize for that one either. Um, there are some cultures where, like for example, in Afghanistan, where um, clan or tribal feuds and even family feuds um, are still extant, like they still exist to this very day and they've been going on. These feuds have lasted for hundreds of years. And um, so there's a, it, the, the culture is so aggressive that males carry weapons around like uh, Kalashnikov rifles around with them, automatic rifles around with them in their daily work. Um, and just as a sort of a social, um, what do you call it, a, a fashion, it's like a fashion and, uh, item you know, have, to have a, a, a Kalashnikov rifle slung over your shoulder. And this is, this is nothing to do with uh, the Taliban, nothing to do with the recent wars that have been there. It's always been thus in, in Afghanistan, that it's a, a violent culture. And you can imagine that if children grow up in that culture, then it's more likely that uh, the males at least will be um, more aggressive than if they grew up in a different culture. I mean, the same males in a different culture. 
Now, female aggression, um, when they've done uh, the necessary research on it, they say that the hormones estrogen and progesterone uh, are together implicated in female aggression. Um, and most female aggression occurs during the premenstrual period when these hormones are at high levels. And the aggression is higher after giving birth to a baby if her baby is threatened. So if someone threatens a woman's baby, she can become extremely aggressive, as you will know. Um, it's um, uh, part of our evolutionary heritage for this. It's like the, the, uh, the offspring must be protected at all costs, even at the cost of your own life. Um, so it's not clear whether the uh, estrogen and progesterone, progesterone um, cause the aggression or merely amplify it as, as with the testosterone. It's, it's now that it's, all we know is that it's implicated as hormones are implicated because of the, the high rate of female aggression during premenstrual times when these hormones are at high levels. But I would imagine, knowing what we know about the brain, that uh, one size doesn't fit all. And a, you could have females that are more prone to aggression than other females because of their neural circuitry and the way their, their, their neural networks are, are arranged. Um, and their called their DNA inheritance. Um, so not all not all are equal, and not all will respond in the same way. Yeah. Now glucocorticoids and aggression. Uh, so glucocorticoid is a stress hormone, and uh, it enhances amygdala function. And so the the glucocorticoid can disrupt prefrontal cortex functioning. Um, causing inappropriate decision-making. So when you get a big um, injection of glucocorticoids into the brain as a result of stress, then decision-making becomes very difficult or, or wise decision-making becomes very difficult and probably the wrong decisions will be made. Now, is there an aggression hormone? Uh, well, the answer is no single hormone has been implicated in aggression. It's a product of multiple internal and external factors. So um, as with everything else, the one size doesn't fit all. In other words, there's so many factors in there. There are multiple, multiple factors involved in everything that human beings do. And there's no single answer to anything. Um, there's no single chemical we can take that will fix it all um, because there are so many different systems and so many different chemicals involved. Now, early experience and aggression that was childhood. Um, this one's a quite a short short section because it's a, it's a, so the strongest environmental um, early childhood factor in development of aggression is cultural rather than familial. So what that means is that um, if a child is going to grow up aggressive because of cultural or because of environmental factors, the most um, or the strongest environmental factor is the culture they live in, not necessarily the family. So in other words, it's not the family that creates the aggression, it's the culture that the family is embedded in that creates the aggression or that influences a child to become aggressive. Um, so all the evidence so far indicates that uh, regression is a result of a mixture of biological and environmental factors. And then finally, looking at um, uh, what you might call the, um, uh, might be the upside, upside of it all. Um, we look, we're going to look at, oh, in, this, in this section, uh, which is a, um, a section on cooperation, how, how, did we, how did we get to be cooperative people? if we're so aggressive. Um, and in this section, we're going to look at evolutionary ecology, evolutionary kin selection, pseudo kinship and reciprocal altruism. Now, warrior classes um, in cultures tend to be more common in pastoralist cultures than in agriculturalist ones. So in other words, cultures that roam the countryside, uh, roam the, uh, the territory um, with their herds um, are more likely to have stronger warriors, uh, sort of, I'm going to say like a, a stronger warrior class or a bigger warrior class or a more dominant warrior class 
than agricultural ones with people settled in one place and aren't moving around. And that makes a bit of sense because if you're moving around, you're going to come into contact with um, other groups also wanting to graze their animals on the same the same tech land um, or muscle in on your land or your your range your territory. So it's more likely that um, you're going to encounter or you're going to encounter them more often. Whereas people who are settled in one place are not moving around. The only the only time they're going to encounter um, others is when someone else comes and wants to take what they've got. Um, so if that doesn't happen, then they don't need warriors. And usually what happened with agricultural uh, dwellers or agriculturalists is that they, they had a sort of a, a citizen soldier arrangement, whereas a, um, a, the citizens uh, would spend you know, most, of the, most of the year doing their farming. And then a portion of the year they had to spend uh, in the army uh, for the, the king or the emperor, whoever, whoever was in charge at the time. And um, they also found that um, organised aggression was more common in desert dwellers than in rainforest dwellers. And uh, if you look at um, where, where the most aggression is happening in the world at the moment, uh, the Middle East is certainly a hotspot. Um, so you see a, a lot of, a lot of uh, warfare going on in the Middle East and uh, you don't see a lot of warfare going on in the Amazon rainforest. So it, it's... Um, it's something to do with the, the nature of the, the country that the people live in. Um, and of course, uh, there's also a significant amount of aggression in, in evolutionary terms for um, reproductive access to females. So that's pretty universal across all, all, uh, all, what do you call, all cultures and all um, e ecosystems, all ecologies. So you'll find that um, the, the desire to have access to females for reproduction is a universal thing. And that's been with us since the beginning of um, the first species that developed different males and different females. So different, I mean, the, the female of the species was different from the male of the species. When that happened, from that moment forward, uh, males have been roaming around looking for females. And, um, and females have been uh, very choosy about which males they, they take on. Um, and that hasn't stopped. It's still going. And if it does stop, then the species is, is a dead end species will stop too, because it's all part. It's all part of keeping keeping the DNA going, and that's what that's what life on Earth is really all about: is keeping our DNA alive, keeping it going, keeping it passed down from one generation to the next. And um, if uh, the rate of making babies slows down then the species will come to a dead end. Yeah. Okay, so that was um, um, evolutionary, look at the next one is evolutionary kin selection. Now kin selection is where um, the people with the same DNA or more or less the same DNA want to pass their DNA on um, to the exclusion of everyone else's. So that's where you get the them and us uh, syndrome um, or attitude. Uh, us are the true, we're the true humans, we're the ones with the, the real DNA. The people down the road, that's them. That, they don't have our DNA, so uh, they, they don't deserve it. They, they should not be um, in the gene pool at all. They should be taken right out of the gene pool. Um, and this eventually developed into aggression between non kin groups. So if um, and even to this day, apparently in the highlands of New Guinea, in the more um, isolated parts, if two uh, indigenous people meet on a path and they don't know each other, then they'll sit down and they'll try to establish, is there a kinship connection? Do they have a common ancestor? And if they can't establish a common ancestor, then they're obligated to kill each other. It's like the one to kill the other. Um, and it's... Uh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's really harking back to the primitive times in evolution where uh, uh, it's very important for our DNA to be passed on and to prevent the passing on of other, other DNAs. Um, so that's kin selection. Now, when we develop nation states, in other words, uh, lots of kin groups living together in the one place, and it was necessary that we all cooperated, uh, we had a thing called pseudo kinship. 
In other words, people started behaving as if they were all part of the same family. It's like uh, now we're all Aussies or we're all China, Chinese or we're all um, Russians or we're all um, Americans, whatever, whatever your nation happens to be. So it's a bit like we have a family, a, a pseudo kinship family, and we will, um, we will fight to protect our group against all other groups. Um, and that's known as pseudo kinship. And that, that developed when uh, we moved out of the, the you know, small clan way of living and into larger uh, groups of people where it was no longer possible for everyone to be related to each other by, by uh, DNA. And then finally, um, we found out that uh, it was more pleasurable to cooperate with people than it was to kill them. So in other words, uh, in experiments even today show that people who are put in a laboratory and given tasks to do, and some are given the task to cooperate with others and, and another bunch are given the task to um, uh, compete with others. The ones that do the cooperating have a bigger dose of dopamine in their brain than the people who do the competing. I mean, the ones that win, of course, not the ones that lose. So um, in a competition, the winners get a certain amount of dopamine injected into their brain. Um, however, the, the ones who did the cooperate, cooperating, in other words, instead of fighting each other or competing with each other and having a winner and a loser, but everyone is a winner, um, they had a bigger shot of dopamine. So this pleasure that we get from reciprocal altruism, which is if you do me a favor today, you, uh, I'll do you a favor in the future. Um, as we've seen in the course before, um, this reciprocal al al altruism um, was a great, uh, what do you call it, um, antidote for aggression or in you know, intergroup, between group aggression. And um, the only problem we have is when uh, the group, one group sees that there's nothing that the other group's got that they could possibly want. So they've got nothing to lose by attacking them. Um, but if, if, I mean, I say in terms of uh, reciprocating, in terms of cooperating, if there's no advantage to cooperating with this group, then they might as well attack them. Um, but if there's an advantage in cooperating, if you're both going to come out the winners, then it's much better to, to just cooperate and forget about the attacking here. Yeah. Okay, so that's um, our, our tour, today's tour of the behavioral neurobiology of aggression. And while it's a, um, a sort of a painful subject in a way, uh, but it's one that need, needs to be addressed because if the human species is going to um, survive at all, uh, in, and we seem to be heading towards some sort of global community, that's the direction we seem to be wanting to go in, and it's certainly possible with um, digital technology. In other words, we can we can communicate instantly with anyone in any part of the world. Um, so global a global um, community is highly possible. But for that to work, we have to make sure that um, we find a way to uh, neutralise aggression. Um, but I'm, I'm inclined to say, well, good luck with that. <laughs> the reason being that. Um, for aggression to be eliminated, um, you, know, you, you really got to do some microsurgery on, on some, some human brains in the world because it's, the, it's, partly, it's partly a neurological problem, not just an environmental, and not just a cultural problem. So you've got, you've got biology involved as well as culture and, and, um, and um, learning. Okay, well, that's all for today. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye for now.